Hi, everyone. Olga is here to have a special guest today. I'll let Darshan to introduce himself, and we'll talk about everything bio. Thanks for having me, Olga. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. I've been following your show for a while, so it's exciting to be on. My name is Darshan. In terms of my background, I'm a pharmacist. I'm a lawyer. I have a law firm that does FDA regulatory law and compliance. In terms of my background, I was general counsel, chief compliance officer. I've been uh, VP of regulatory strategy and policy for global consulting companies. I have been corporate counsel for a pharma company. I'm also a visiting professor at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, written a few books. Lawyers who had lives before law always fascinating to me. I was a few shows ago talked to, to Kay, who was a former nurse. Um, right. And she, she had a very interesting journey to becoming a lawyer, becoming a privacy specialist. Um, you had been a pharmacist. I haven't. I, I don't know many lawyers who have been pharmacists because you know that's that's definitely a profession that takes a while to to get to and has its hurdles of its own. Tell us uh, how you got to pharmacy and how you ventured into law. So I was definitely a pharmacist before, but if you go even further, I was actually a national level fighter in two different countries. So I was, um, I had a national silver, I want to say, in the U.S. in judo, and a national bronze in India. Is the point of this to make me feel like an under two, or you're succeeding? You're totally on it. <laughs> it it's more to go. Uh, I like, I like to think that I did more than study. Um, but who knows if that was pretty much all I did? My life changed afterwards, and I decided that I wanted to be uh, more academic. And to that, I, I'm a sixth generation um, pharmacist. I knew very, very early on that I wanted to work in an area that um, related to the pharmaceutical industry. So I knew very early on that all businesses, doesn't matter what business it is, runs off of three major legs, the technical aspects of the business, the legal aspects of the business, and the business aspects of the business. In my case, I, I got the technical down with the PharmD. I got the legal down with my JD. Um, I grew up in India for the most part, uh, for the first half of my life. And um, so I, I did a bunch of things in, in high school, which was like fine accounting and journals and ledgers and all that good stuff. And that that really sort of prepared me for what uh, some of the business aspects are. Um, and that still excites me and, uh, and innovation still excites me. And that's sort of what made me go, if I want to ever run my own company, I need to have these, these uh, elements out of the way. So that's why I went, got a PharmD, uh, which is a doctorate in pharmacy, but it tends to be more focused on a clinical doctorate. So that's why uh, I had my PharmD. Then I went back, got my JD, went back, got my master's in quality assurance regulatory affairs, did a clerkship in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, did a fellowship. And yeah, I think that's most of my degrees. At what point did you decide that the generation of pharmacists stops here and the generation of lawyers begins? What, what was what was the... <laughs> I, I like to think that the generation of pharmacists never stopped. I like to think that it's still there. I, I believe that the future is about knowing how different elements come together, knowing that um, it's not just going to be about, oh, can you be a good lawyer? It's can you understand how your law applies to my business? So um, so that's why I, I like to think that my future, if I have kids, uh, will have the same exact thing. They'll they'll go back, they'll learn more, and and try to see at the intersection, if you will. So, so, so the, the, last the, the pressure to be a pharmacist is still there for your kids. Is, is that the clarification? I I personally never been in biotech. Uh, I've always been basically in software, whether it's a business to business or business to consumer software. Yeah. Um, so um, as I said in the beginning of the show, I'm I'm out of my depths in 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 minute you know three of this conversation. But I do know one thing uh, is that biotech is booming. Tell, tell me why. Well, let, let's actually take take a step back, and I'm going to argue with your your premise that you don't know much about uh, about biotech because the truth is that biotech affects each one of us in a very very intimate way. It affects our health, um, and you are a software expert, and you've done that B two B, you've done that B two C, and probably about 20 years ago, I'd agree they're completely different fields. But at this point. Um, biotech is is very dependent on the software and, and, and on IT. I mean, one of the biggest things that has happened um, in the last week was that Amy Abernathy is leaving the FDA. And Amy Abernathy, I think, was uh, deputy commissioner, if I remember correctly. 
but she her her big claim to fame was that she is the IT expert, and she brought that to the FDA, and um, the FDA is sort of changing how they see the world because of how she brought some of her expertise in house. So my point being, um, your expertise in um, IT in software is critical to how yeah. biotech is going to be booming. Darshan, uh, we're going to be good friends. You know how to compliment <laughs> me. Uh, yeah, that is that is the, the first level of our friendship. That sounds great. Uh, I, I am an expert in biotech. Let's go from there. It's only going to get better. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So so let's let's so you're an expert in biotech. Now let's talk about biotech and why is it booming? I believe if I remember correctly, the last time I checked, um, biotech is a two trillion dollar industry. Uh, health and biotech is a two trillion dollar industry. So software and IT has gone out and basically said we've con- we've created a whole new industry. Now let's revolutionize another. And the two industries that really pop up for me that that people keep looking at are um, biotech and fintech, and and um, they're both being enabled. The changes are both being enabled because of um, the health IT movement. Uh, well, the health IT movement and the fin IT movement in the other case. So my point is that they're they're changing dramatically because the old ways are being abandoned. And when I th- think of the old ways, what I'm referring to is this idea that uh, we're going to test 10,000 compounds and we're then going to land up with one at the end of it uh, after 20 years. Um, what IT is doing is it's saying, well, do we really need 10,000? Can are there ways to speed that process up? And and IT is enabling that process. And the more you enable it the more opportunities you get. And the more opportunities you get, you're going to see more booming. And that's why everyone's entering that market. Amazon's saying, you know what? You've got the drugs now. Let's let's make sure it gets to the right people. So the distribution practices are changing. You've got uh, CVS saying, you know what? You've got the drugs, but maybe we need to change the way we dispense um, healthcare. And, and the, so the pharmacy is changing as well. Um, you've got the FDA saying, you've, we, we know how to approve the drugs, but we don't even know where to begin in terms of reanalyzing how artificial artificial intelligence is going to change the world. So my point is, it's booming because there's so many opportunities, and um, and biotech is is ripe for innovation. I love it. Let's talk about opportunities a lot because you are a good example of of, of many things, including. Uh, fluidly going between um, in-house practice and private practice and um, putting out thought leadership. Um, just curious how you think about the staff, uh, because you know the past way of thinking is that you're either in-house or you are in private practice. Um, you have this fluidity that I find very alluring um, and really I, what I think is the quality of a modern lawyer. Tell me how you think about it. So I, I think that the modern lawyer is one who comes to the table with solutions. It's not the one who's coming in with um, the traditional, let me tell you what's wrong. It's coming in with, here are some pot- potential options, not just because I think so, but this is what the other companies are doing. So the best value you can add in an in-house position is understanding what your competitors, what um, your what companies that look like you are doing. Often that that involves being a consultant. Additionally, you also want someone who understands what it's like to think in-house. And what, what do I mean by that? Lawyers generally have this perspective that, you know what, I need to protect myself. 100% you do need to. But you need to also understand what your client is looking for. And the client is looking for answers that are right for them. So giving them an answer without understanding how they think is a disservice to your client. And that's why I think um, coming to them with the perspective of, oh, I've seen this happen in four other companies. In your specific instance of, op- of these four options, one of these makes sense because of blah, blah, and blah. It- it's really understanding what that in-house perspective is because you don't often get to go, you know what, um, here's a unique legal situation that I think is right because of just legal implications. You're dealing with medical affairs, you're dealing with advertising, you're dealing with um, clinical, clinical trials, uh, reimbursement, and all those things have to come together. And that's that's a perspective I, ha- I like to believe I bring to the table. Yeah, no, that's very, I'm with you. I, I do think this divide between in-house and private practice is, is artificial, but yet, you know, why not? We have many artificial divides in, in, in the world, in the legal world, in the world in general. So it only makes sense that we have it, I suppose. So why not here? Uh, very um, interesting. Um, you know, you, as you've been talking, uh, 
you mentioned one term, which is uh, patient centricity. Um, you know, I guess intrinsically, I understand what it is. I'm, you know, overeducated person, but I, I would like to kind of, <laughs> I would like to understand your definition or the, the industry definition and maybe implications it may have on, on your practice as a lawyer, whether you're in house or a law firm. Um, I think a really easy way to think about it is um, whatever you think patient centricity is, is what patient centricity is. And the reason I say that is because no one's really defined it properly yet. There are 100 definitions out there. No one's agreeing to what that actually means. A really, the way I think about it is the first version, what, what I think of as pharma 1.0 was a scenario where pharma said, you know, what, we're going to come up with what we think is the answer. That was great. That was what we we're going to do. And then there's a there's a wall that separates us from healthcare providers. We're going to throw it over the wall and you, doctor, can then sort of use it because that's what you get. That, that's what I have. Pharma 2.0 was saying, let's break that silo down. Let's have the, the doctors work with the visit with the pharma companies and come up with treatments that are right for their patients. So that that wall was broken. That was Pharma 2.0. Pharma 3.0 is wait, who's the, who's the actual beneficiary of this? It's supposed to be patients. It's supposed to be understanding what their needs are. And that's where we are right now. So it's it's putting the, the patient in the middle of the conversation, not assuming that we know what patients want, but knowing, um, asking them and, and sort of having that conversation. So when, you, when you're dealing with uh, patients who have, um, who have cancer, for example, one of the big assumptions everyone's made for decades has been, you know what would be really great? Cancer kills quickly. So if we can prolong your life, that's awesome. So all a lot of the treatments were geared towards how long can I prolong your life? Then we start talking to patients and they go, I don't want to have a really shitty life that's long. I'd rather have a really good life that's short. So that conversation around how, how do we enable you to have better quality of life is intuitive and obvious, but didn't happen until we spoke to patients. And that that's patient centricity, putting the patient in the middle of the conversation. Yeah, very interesting. I guess uh, there is a parallel discussion about client centricity in law that is very similar. We, we've generally, the, the, the traditional thought process is that as lawyers, our goal is to protect the company. And that's great. That's what we do. We are, one of the requirements is we represent, represent our, um, our clients with zeal, which is awesome. Here's the problem. In that scenario, we're ignoring the needs of the people we actually went into the business for, which is saving lives. And a result of that has been that uh, regulators have come out and said, um, what you need to do is you need to actually give up some of that control. So what we need to do is enable a orderly giving up of control. And that sounds like the antithesis of what a lawyer uh, needs to We're do. orderly giving up of control. Note, everybody, that's a term. I love it. Now, let, let, let's actually have step one through, I don't know, seven, five, how many, however many steps it takes for us to get to, you know, because lawyers are control enthusiasts. I'm being one, a good example of them. So how, how do we get there to to orderly giving up control? So I, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of it. The The uh, the best example of it is patient centricity. And what I mean by that is in the context of patient centricity, stop thinking about how you can protect your company. Think about and, and, and sort of how and, and stop thinking from the pers perspective of do I follow the law? The more likely a, a, a much better way of doing that is going, how do I help the patient? If you help the patient, you're probably going to follow the law. It's, it's really just how do you do that in an appropriate way? So um, it's very weird to hear a lawyer say this, that don't try to follow the law, try to help the patient. And if you help the patient, you'll follow the law. And an example of that is in the context of um, clinical trials. What we've always traditionally done is, you know what, we're doing clinical trials, all the data that we're getting belongs to me as the pharma company. I'm going to control this data. European version of the FDA, EMEA, came out and said, you know what, that's not going to work. What we want is you to actually give the data uh, raw data that that um, may be anonymized, but we're going to enable, you, we're going to require that you start giving up that data to people who need it. And Health Canada, Health Canada is, is doing something similar as well. So the question is now, how do you do that in a way that you can still anonymize and help the be help benefit patients, but also help be help benefit future treatments 
by appropriate anonymization, by helping controls around it. So that orderly giving up of control of your IP in a way that your IP is still protected, but identifying specifically what that is. Instead of this amorphous, everything we've created belongs to me. Yeah. Especially when it's patient's data. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I mean, we know that all, I, I'm an IP lawyer by design. Um, yeah. You know, that's yeah. that's what I went to law school doing. And we know that basically every every exception, or almost every exception in IP law is, is, is around bias. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, it's partially because you can't own things that are in nature and partially because there is a tag of war between, you know, the, uh, the forces of, of innovation that are encouraged by IP laws, yet what humanity needs. Uh, you know, for, yeah, for us to stay alive and for us to thrive and for us to be good human beings. So yeah. many exceptions, especially when it happens, are around essentially biotech. Um, and, um, and, and I guess to some extent it, it makes sense. And very quickly, this conversation, you know, from protection and IP and legal gets into kind of related conversations about transparency, <laughs> trust, yeah. and ethics. Um, and so let's talk about, you know, this. Well, I'm going to add one more thing before we go down that, by the way. A parallel discussion to IP is also ownership of data, which if you if you read the Henrietta Lacks case, it was a situation where we as an industry, basically failed patients, because we said, we're going to take your cells and we're going we're gonna to sell them and make billions off of it and that family never benefited. Now we're doing the same thing with, uh, with Ancestry.com, basically, and I'm not calling out a company, I'm saying this was what happened several years ago, uh, where we basically said, we're going to collect all your data and we're then going to sell it to a pharma company. And, and maybe it was in the terms of, terms of service, but patients never fully understood what they're giving out. Well, we know that you know lawyers don't read terms of service. Even those of us who write them professionally, like yeah. I, I, I've written them in the beginning of my career, and I can tell you how many times I read terms of services. And exactly. and, and, the, and the answer to that will be very accurately as approaching zero. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but but this role of both in-house lawyer and actually outside lawyer in advising companies that are in biotech or even in tangential industries that could be selling to biotech around transparency, trust, and ethics. Uh, how do you approach that? It really comes down to a very simple thing. Treat others the way you'd want to be treated. And, and that comes down to, well, if you are participating in a study, isn't it only fair that you get, get to see the results of the study you participated in? So that's transparency. If you participate in the study, don't you have a right to believe that they're going to look in your best interest and protect them? That's privacy. Um, if, if you're participating in a clinical study and you're saying that I'm doing this because it's not just for me. In fact, it's probably not for me. It's actually for um, for the benefit of humanity. Well, then in that case, it's how do you enable that data to be shared? So it really comes down to what would you want to happen to you in that scenario? And there, there are different trust models and we can talk about the different trust models that are out there. But But for the most part, it, it, that's what it boils down to. Just put yourself in someone else's shoes and see where it takes us. Yeah, that, that's very similar conversation that I would have with my clients yeah. around, you know, look, we, we, we're building software and various applications, you know, and you and I have conversations as builders, but you're yeah. also a consumer of software everywhere you yeah. go increasingly. So, um, you know, Imagine yourself in the show using it, and, and then your answer to what we as a business should do and stand behind may be different. Um, how hard do you find this conversation? Because I think it's a kind of similar type of conversation, because even if you're not patient today, you know, very few of us, you know, will leave planet Earth without ever being a patient um, of any kind. Um, right. maybe, you know, and so putting yourself, you know, or indefinitely we'll see loved ones or, you know, friends go through this. So. Um, it's inherently an experience where we can put ourselves in the shoe of another, even with the minimal ability to empathize. Um, how do you have that conversation, and how hard has it been to have conversations like this? It's, it used to be a much more difficult conversation. And the reason it used to be a much more difficult conversation was we all, we're, as, as lawyers, we're trained to continuously see ourselves on the defensive and go, we are being attacked. My, what's mine is being taken away. Uh, and that came from every intellectual property agreement, every licensing agreement you've ever written, you've ever read, to ever negotiated. 
to every sub-licensing deal, to every um, M&A deal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now to say, you know what, we took all these efforts, we spent all this money to get all this stuff, and now I'm just expected to give it away for free. That was a much harder conversation to have then. Now it's just regulatorily, regulatorily required to be more transparent. It's now regulatory required to, um, to maintain people's privacy. That's all well and good. Now here's where I take it to that next level. What I'm thinking about is those regulatory requirements are the floor, they're not the ceiling. What you need to start thinking about as a, as a pharma company, what we need to start thinking about as a people is this idea of how do I take it to a, where the, to a place where the patient's needs are met? Find out what that patient's looking for. And a really good example of that is in the context of lay summaries. Right now, a big thing that pharma companies do, they say things like, we're going to publish our data in New England Journal of Medicine. That's one of the most reputable journals out there. And, and that's going to be amazing because doctors are going to trust us because we published it in New England Journal mm -hmm. of Medicine. The problem with that scenario is a very simple thing. The moment you do that, it doesn't benefit patients. So now what you've got to do is you've got to say, we're going to take that article that's intended for people with PhDs and MDs, and we're going to simplify it for something that a patient at an eighth grade level can understand. But there, and, and the European version of the FDA is doing that. Here's the problem. You try to do that appropriately, and, and the problem is no one really knows how to. They don't actually explain what they want. They, they give you some details, but those details don't actually address the question. Should you use more visuals? Um, should you use more writing? Is it eighth grade level or should it be 10th or should it be fourth? Um, and you lose a lot in translation. So there are legitimate reasons why people fight back. But then you start looking at the actual potential lay summaries that have been put out and you realize they're nowhere close to understandable by anyone without a PhD. So, so that fundamental putting yourself in someone else's shoes and having a conversation and, and being vulnerable is, is what's fundamentally missing. And hopefully we'll get there soon. You know, I, I want to send you know, a few questions. I guess maybe I'll, ask, I'll, I'll start with the question, why be a biotech lawyer? I like to think that the, the question is not even whether you should be a biotech lawyer. I think the question is, how do you make a change in a way that still protects your company and still benefits the patients? That's why you're in this. And if being a biotech lawyer gets you there, great. That's how you should do it. But I'm trying to do it from the perspective of how do I leave a mark so that in the end, patients benefit. Um, not unreasonable requests from patients, not unreasonable requests from pharma, but that, that happy medium. And I, I, believe, I truly believe that happy medium will shift over time. Initially, the happy medium will be more controlled by pharma, but eventually that, that control will be taken, avo taken away. And some of those examples are going to end up being uh, using technology like blockchain, using uh, distributed ledger technologies, using AI, uh, using um, uh, nonprofits that are, that are going to land up sharing this data. Um, but but don't do it because you're a lawyer and, and that's your identity. Do it because you're a person. And I think that's how, how I take it. You are a human first. If you were to think about kind of how, um, you know, how would you acquire that expertise? Uh, what is your advice? Traditionally, it's framed as I graduated from law school. I'm a junior lawyer slash junior human. What do I do? Um, <laughs> I actually think we all have rights to become, you know, biotech lawyers if we have a calling in any time of our lives, even post retirement, whenever that post retirement hits you. Um, so uh, very deliberately asking kind of about pivots that may happen in every stage of a career. Um, how, how would you recommend thinking about it? I, I think right, one of the advantages we now have is we have the opportunity to spread our experiences. And that's unique. Uh, originally, that used to be um, cave paintings. Then it became publishing. And now we've got the opportunity to, for each of us to uh, have our own printing press accessible online. And we're doing it right now as we speak on using StreamYard. Um, my point being, reflect on your own experiences and, and see what works for you, what doesn't. It, it, understand what the other side is thinking. Uh, and, and you've seen examples of that. Um, becoming a lawyer is not the only way to advocate for something. A really good example of that is there's a growing industry of patient advocates. And these patient advocates are taking on the cause of patients. And they're saying, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a parent of a child who's affected by this. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a woman 
who, and this is actually today's news, who is dying and needs this drug and you won't give it to me, pharma company. It's, it's, it's not been approved, but the government doesn't have a problem with you giving it to me, but you won't give it to me. And I think that's the fundamental breakdown, which is stop, stop thinking of yourself as um, a lawyer that's protecting things. Think of yourself as an enabler and an advocate for causes you care about. And no one woke up in the morning saying, I care about protecting intellectual property. What they came up with, I would protect the interests of my client, pr- protect the interests of someone who needs it, both as patients and as a company, because the company's got to survive too. But how do you meet those two interests? So that's that's what I would think about. What law gives to us is understanding what the building blocks are. So we are well positioned to enable a process to happen. Yeah, I love it. So be a human first. And then being an advocate is not confined to being an attorney. You can be an advocate from every position. And we increasingly see that, you know, uh, folks without legal uh, benefit of legal um education and experience can be effective advocates, probably even more effective to some extent. Uh, we also have seen that law being the floor and a very effective way to scale justice, but also an opportunity to build on top of it and, uh, and achieve much more than the law requires. Um, in terms of sort of hard skills um, as a lawyer to, to propel, to really add value to this conversation, to your individual clients, to the industry, and to humanity as a whole, uh, what would you recommend? I, I think um, hard skills would probably be good writing. I think hard skills is good at oral advocacy. Um, I tend to prefer oral advocacy, not because I don't have good writing skills, but because I actually think that you can sp- share more messages. Um, and you're doing that right now. Again, notes to my legal self. Um, it, it's it's the idea that I can, I can share my voice. I can advocate for a position. It's also just spending the time reading and learning, understanding why things are the way they are. The, the idea of stare decisis, if you will, um, understanding what caused things to be the way they are, because you can't change precedent unless you understand why the precedent was there in the first place, to draw, to draw that distinction and say why, why things have changed. The other hard skill is, is just being ready to go advocate for yourself and for people who don't have that voice. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's funny, we have a recurring conversation around control, right? And in the end, the only person that you can master controlling is yourself. Exactly. Um, and, and that's the one thing that we put off and, and struggle with, you know, for majority, if not entirety of our lives and, um, and definitely a skill worth perfecting. Uh, there's an, a, a very a fantastic conversation. Um, we're coming to the end. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, um, I, I know I could have asked you many more things and we could talk about all kinds of things for a long time. A thought you want to leave us with that I did not touch on. I, I already already see myself like Jerry Springer. Everything, all the craziness <laughs> has happened and now I have to sum it all up. Um, <laughs> I, I think, honestly, your title sums it all up. It's, no, it's notes to myself. It's understanding who you are. And if you can, while you're a lawyer, do it to your legal stuff and enable that process too. know who you are and, and become the best version of who you are. So it helps others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darshan. I am um, always inspired. I love your show. I encourage everyone to follow Darshan and, and his shows. He, if you want to have kind of more substantive geeky conversation in biotech, I know for a fact that Darshan can deliver on that. <laughs> uh, he has lots of insights about industry. And, um, you know, one way or another, this industry will touch us all, whether we are practitioners in it or not. Um, so I've learned a lot about it. I, for me, the favorite thought is you're human first. Um, I think it's a very important principle. And uh, with that in mind, thank you very much, everyone. 